Hello and welcome to Expats Everywhere. If you could tell us your name, where you're from, and a little about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Michael Paul Hernandez. I'm from originally from San Antonio, Texas. I've lived abroad for about, I would say a total of, I can't even think about it, about four years now. Okay. Um, I've lived in Korea for three years and about nine months in Saudi Arabia. Okay, wow, Saudi Arabia. What's it like working in Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia is the most diametrically opposed culture from the United States. It's literally the most opposite place you could get, maybe with the exception of North Korea. Okay, uh, what kinds of, of jobs are available in Saudi Arabia? Oh, in Saudi Arabia, it's technically considered like a developing culture. So since they're flush with cash, they're trying to basically catch up or keep up with the, the international Joneses. So <clears throat> they will hire any sort of um, job or profession or really pretty much anyone who has a specialty um, to basically catch the country up to, I don't want to say the modern world, but basically the, the Western world. So any sort of accreditation, any sort of um, international proficiency levels of anything, um, including obviously uh, petroleum, but you know, education to get the population going. Um, any kind of job like that pays very well, um, but of course there's always caveats to why they're paying you that much. Right. So uh, from your experience, where are most of the expats from? Oh, they're really from all over. Um, I would say the majority of people that I've run into are Americans. I think they have kind of a preference uh, specifically for uh, maybe American accents, um, but in terms of people who work here, I do want to say the mo a lot of the companies I I've encountered, I, I don't know the statistics, but um, are um, mainly American, and there's obviously you know uh, Western European and, and British and Australian people here. Okay, what is it like working in Saudi Arabia? Well, that's a big question. Um, it's probably the most uh, life-changing, informative thing that I've, I, I don't want to say I'll, I'll ever do, but that I've done to date. Um, I thought living in South Korea was difficult, um, but I've learned more about myself, um, how to rely on myself, how to interact with others in a really harsh environment, um, both um, in terms of the weather and in terms of uh, maybe the I don't want to say the job conditions, but maybe the cultural restraints that are placed on you because of the uh, because of where you are. Okay. Well, if you could tell us, what's your job and what does a typical day look like for you at your job? Yeah, so I'm an ESL teacher, um, a contractor through um, a university. So uh, I'm not a professor, um, so I'm a contractor. Um, so that basically entails, um, I have a set curriculum. Um, I can change it a little bit, um, and I can kind of go off on small tangents, but for the most part they want to have everybody um, in line and kind of in lockstep with the curriculum they want. Um, a lot of the curriculum is um, American-based culture. Um, they, it, it seems like they want to um, acculturate a lot of the native population here to possibly the Western workers they will encounter with the petroleum companies or any of the international companies that work here. So it's mainly to uh, expose a lot of the students to Western culture. Okay. Um, could you tell us a little like uh, in detail about what it's like, what time you wake up, and then what time do you finish work? Yeah, so um, for Saudi Arabia, the uh, work day um, has been a, much shorter, um, or at least this is the least I've worked in one day um, than any other job I've ever had. So uh, a typical work day, I'd um, wake up, let's say, about 6. I'll catch the bus at about 6.30. Um, we'll get to work uh, about 30 minutes later, but actual class time, I want to say is, uh, let's say close to three and a half to four hours. The rest of the time from, let's say, seven to 1.30 um, is just office hours. So that means we can you know, do paperwork or do grading or maybe uh, planning for the next day, but actual in-class uh, hours is really only about four hours a day. It's fairly short. Okay, wow, that sounds pretty nice. Um, at a job like this, how much can you expect to earn? Yeah, so um, I would say the, the lowest I've seen in Saudi Arabia for teaching is about 3,000 US. And of course, that's tax-free um, with 
uh, housing uh, included, um, and really all the way up to barbaric amounts of money um, in terms of uh, teaching English. So if you're maybe a, if you have a PhD in linguistics, you're obviously going to fare a lot better in the job market here. Uh, maybe working physically at a university. Okay, what types of benefits do you receive from your job? Yeah, obviously, like I said, besides like the personal benefits of, of growing in a very stressful environment, um, just um, housing. Um, we receive free housing, free transportation. Uh, the healthcare system um, is very cheap um, in comparison to the U.S. We all know that's uh, very different, <clears throat> and. Um, the general cost of living is very low, uh, so not only do you save on rent, uh, transportation costs, uh, healthcare costs, you're able to save all of that, um, and it, it, it's really a, a huge benefit that you really wouldn't get anywhere else. Okay, <clears throat> so this, this type of money that you're talking about, um, over 3000 per month, um, upwards of, of maybe 8000 or... Sure. I mean, I, I have seen, um, it, specifically in, in terms of teaching English, uh, yeah, I would say up, upwards of like ten to 15000 depending on like experience. Um, okay, so uh, on the lower end, do you think that this money is enough, and what type of lifestyle can you live? Yeah, I, um, of course, I mean, sometimes there, there's never enough money. Um, hmm. So it's always important to keep in mind what are your goals and what are your priorities. Um, if you just fixate on money, obviously there's never enough money. So I feel that if you don't come here with a particular goal in mind, um, it's one, very easy to spend that money because um, Saudi Arabia is a huge uh, hub uh, or has a lot of international hubs where you can travel to Africa, Europe, Asia and just blow all your money. Um, so if you're, I would say, not even goal oriented, if you just have a one particular goal um, in mind, of maybe just saving money, um, it'll pay off at the end. Okay, so what kind of lifestyle can you live off of this salary? Yeah, um, a lifestyle here in Saudi Arabia, I wouldn't say that there's an overt amount of things you can do publicly. Um, of course, you can do go out to restaurants, um, go shopping and maybe interact on the compound that you live in, but in terms of uh, general Western amenities uh, that Americans are used to, going to the movies, just hanging out with um, men and women together, that is literally not an option. There's shops and stores you can't, you physically cannot go into if, unless your wife is present or if you're not there with, with your family. Okay. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. So in terms, sorry, specifically of the money, um, basically you can save a lot of money and probably buy things you would probably never be able to buy <laughs> in the U.S. Um, I would say if you were making the same amount of money as a teacher in the U.S., um, again, you'd have to pay rent, bills, car, all, those, all that money would go out the door. So here, it's almost like there's that temptation to you know, spend money on, on flights or spend money on, I don't know, like really expensive gifts. So it, the, uh, the option to live a very good life is, is there. Okay. So if one of your friends from back home pressed you and said, you know, I'm looking at going to Saudi Arabia, how much money am I going to be able to save in a year? What would you tell them? Um, I would tell them tax free the, uh, if you never traveled anywhere, um, and if you were, depending if you work, um, say a nine to 12 month contract, you could save anywhere from 10 to upwards of, maybe if you're really frugal, um, let's say 22,000 um, a year. Um, it's, again, the cost of living is so low. Uh, there's, uh, unless you're just throwing money around, there's really not too much to buy here. Okay. How much money does someone need to start up? So they, they've got a job in Saudi Arabia and they're moving you know, what do they need to cover their bases? Yeah, good question. I would say the startup costs, um, just to be, to, to throw out a number, I would say about $500. So I would say to, um, 
just general like house amenities, so pots and pans, uh, maybe if you didn't bring towels, uh, just general household things um, you can and can't live out with. Um, so let's say that would be maybe under $100. Um, if you want the internet, um, the particular contract I'm on was for one year, even though my my physical teaching contract is only for nine months. Okay. Um, so that I had to pay for, um, actually I, I shared that uh, with a friend to split the cost, mm -hmm. but we still had to pay for an entire year up front. Um, any sort of cellular service you have to pay for up front. Um, and really any other things that you want to make yourself initially comfortable, I would say go ahead and buy because it's, uh, if, if you're not used to the culture, it will be the most uh, opposite thing you might have ever encountered. Okay. So let's say that we've you know we saved our money, we've got our job. How do we need to pack? What's the weather like? Yeah, um, I would say um, even though um, you think of the desert that it's always going to be hot, um, you might uh, still want to bring like a light jacket. It will get cold in the winter. Um, and when it does rain, uh, it will rain very hard. So definitely still bring an umbrella if you're, if you're keen on doing that. But um, the UV for this particular region is a little bit higher than the US. So definitely any sort of hat, sunscreen, um, any sort of like light long sleeve shirts up. Uh, if you burn easily, I, I would definitely say to pack those. Um, but definitely remember just to pack light, um, any sort of clothes, um, utilities, basically anything you want to buy is extremely cheap here. So I would say bring literally the bare necessities um, and then buy everything here. Okay. Um, are there any things that you cannot find in Saudi Arabia that you would recommend someone bring? I feel if you do internet research beforehand to see if you can buy it, um, then do that. But I feel for any flight that's let's say over five hours, there's no reason to bring like an entire kitchen pantry with you or there's no reason to bring like, I don't know, the mall with you like in your, in your suitcase. Uh, personally, I, I like to travel as light as possible um, and then just uh, collect the things that I need once I'm there. It's just one, it's cheaper in terms of luggage and it's just less stress, but um, do your research first because some people here are say very keen on, let's say, Sriracha, and they thought, oh, there's a lot of international um, uh, supermarkets here, but they didn't have it. So uh, definitely check on the internet to see if, they, if you need one particular thing. Okay. Um, well, let, let's change gears a little bit and talk about safety. Okay. How safe is it in Saudi Arabia, and do you personally feel safe? I do personally feel safe. Um, you do have to keep in mind, though, that generally not a lot of people will agree to go to Saudi Arabia if you ask them. And even if you say, I'll pay you to go to Saudi Arabia, there aren't very many people who would still say, yes, I'll, I'll go to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, I do feel safe just walking around on a day-to-day -day basis during the day at night. Um, being a male, it is, I would say it's a little bit different for myself. Um, than, than it would be for a female. Um, in terms of like uh, petty theft, like pickpocketing or um, just general stealing of anything, um, it's extremely low. Um, a lot of the crimes here are dealt um, in a very serious manner, so a lot of people seem to second guess whether they should commit crimes here. Okay. okay. Um, well, if you could, tell us about your epic beard. Because I think, I think um, you know, a lot of people might have in their mind that uh, many people in Saudi Arabia, males in Saudi Arabia, have facial hair. So yes. is it recommended that the foreigners also adapt to this? Uh, did you come to Saudi Arabia with uh, a beard? I did have a beard. I mean, just generally in terms of like facial hair, I'm very lazy. So this works very well for me. <laughs> but um, in terms of something they're culturally familiar with, they respect people who have beards. So a lot of the um, imams and cultural leaders will have um, really large, unruly beards, whereas you'll see the younger students or just um, younger generation have very like trim, and I would say almost like manicured, um, shaved beards. 
Um, so I would say it won't overtly help you maybe in your day-to-day -day, um, class. Like some students will respect you more, but I think they will they'll look at you possibly in a little bit more favorable eyes when they initially meet you. Okay. Well, thanks for that cultural tip. Yeah. Um, it doesn't necessarily apply to the women, but uh, it applies to the men. Um, could you tell us, how do you meet people and what can you do for fun? How can you meet people? Um, I would say the, the biggest thing that I learned um, about being here is that Saudis are incredibly friendly. Um, they're, for the most part, very curious, or at least uh, the experience I've had, they've been very curious of, um, of me. Um, some people, maybe it's because of the beard or something, they'll ask me if I'm Egyptian or Syrian or something. Um, and they'll, they'll try to strike up a conversation. Um, there's, outside of the compound, there's an, I wouldn't say um, the location we're in is a little bit rural, so there's not a lot of activities, but if you wanted to play sports, you can do that. If you wanted to um, do any sort of um, desert activities, um, there's a lot of that here. Um, but it, it kind of depends on um, you know, really what you want to do with your day. You have really a lot of hours to, um, that, that are free. Um, I would say the majority of people that I know uh, will stay on the compound um, and just uh, pretend that it's not Saudi Arabia. Uh, here, uh, you know, on the compound we can go swimming, we can walk, uh, women can walk around with an abaya, we can, um, uh, men and women can speak to each other freely and openly without having some sort of intermediary there. Um, so it just seems a little bit str uh, less stressful to do things on the compound. So I would say if you're really into doing things maybe on your own, kind of out away from where you normally live, um, I would definitely make sure that the compound you're living on has a lot of activities, um, or at least a lot of things you would enjoy doing to fill up your time. Okay. And uh, how do you personally pass the time? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So I came here with a savings goal in mind. Um, and actually, you can see it in the video. Um, so, um, so I have a list of things that I, I would like to accomplish. Um, just, um, I guess, over the year. So, coming here, um, I had a small business um, that I had started a while ago that I just wanted to grow. So, any of the money that I um, saved here, I just wanted to put into that, and then a lot of the other free time um, is spent with um, an online master's degree that really takes up a lot of my time, or the majority of my time. So when I'm not working um, at school, I'm at work. So. Okay. Could you tell us, uh, what do you think about Saudi Arabia as a travel hub? Do you think it's a good travel hub? Why and why not? A travel hub for once you live here? Sure. Okay, once you live here, definitely. Um, a lot of the flights to Southeast Asia, specifically uh, India and Sri Lanka, are extremely cheap, um, especially to um, Western Europe are relatively cheap. A lot of the flights to Africa seem um, or at least moderately priced, or at least upwards of like say 500 US dollars. Um, but keep in mind that the Saudi government doesn't have a tourist visa available, so if you want to travel in the country, you have to live here first uh, to be able to travel in the country. Okay. Um, could you tell us what are the pros and cons of living in Saudi Arabia? Uh, let's see, pros, um, again, the there's a lot of pros and there's a lot of cons. Um, let's see, the very first uh, pro that comes to mind is that you can save um, really close to all the money that you earn. Um, if you really want to. Um, two, you can have any sort of jet-setting lifestyle uh, where every, literally every vacation you can travel to a completely different country, which to many of our friends back home in the U.S. is literally a lifestyle that's impossible to, to replicate. Um, that being said, the cons um, are that you're in a very extreme environment, so the weather is hot during the summer. Um, culturally and socially, it's again the closest thing to the opposite of the United States. Um, everything is sexually segregated, um, and I would say there's a 
you'll go through a lot of culture shock once you initially get here. Um, I would say as a traveler, um, or that people who enjoy traveling, um, some people enjoy uh, culture shocks and maybe they can learn about a new culture. Um, but in this, in this case for me personally, it, was, it, it took, I would say, a few weeks to start getting more curious about the culture and to start being very actively like, investigating different things about the culture. Uh, when I first came here, I was extremely weary um, of things that I saw beforehand. Um, so I would say getting over that initial fear of the country um, was kind of a big shock for me. Um, the only other con I could think of, I would definitely say that um, any sort of like bureaucratic uh, office work or um, not office work, but like paperwork that you have to deal with. So in terms of like your visa or passport or really anything that involves paperwork. Banks um, as well. Oh, very, yeah, very good. Um, banks, um, the internet, really any sort of service industry um, that you would expect would take five minutes in the U.S. will take a lot more time. Um, their culture um, is um, what's considered a polychronic culture, where um, the United States is considered monochronic, where if you have a task, uh, let's say you have a task A, B, and C, uh, from a American point of view, that means we'll do task A first, B second, and C third to finish. Um, in terms of a polychronic culture, there is no structure. So when things happen, they happen. So that can kind of be a point of contention with uh, Western people that they don't see the order or the logic in what's happening with their passport or with their visa work. So definitely keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, Michael Paul, you've been incredibly informative. Uh, you've given us some really invaluable information. We really appreciate your time. We want to w uh, wish you the best for your business in the future and uh, finishing your master's. Thank you so much again. Thanks. I appreciate it.